Hi, everyone. This is Dan O'Neill, the Executive Director of the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum. Before we get to our third Sunday presentation, I would like to thank the following businesses for sponsoring today's lecture. They made a vital investment in our museum, and their support is why we are able to bring you this lecture series at no charge. This month, we are really excited to bring you Jess Robinson. Jess is Vermont State Archaeologist. He works within the Division for Historic Preservation in Montpelier. Jess received his Bachelor's in Anthropology and English from the University of Vermont in 1999, his Master's in Literature from the University of Kent in 2001, his Master's in Anthropology from the University at Albany, SUNY in 2008, and his PhD in Anthropology from the University at Albany, SUNY in 2015. During that time, Jess was also a research supervisor at the University of Vermont's Consulting Archaeology Program. As the state archaeologist, Jess is centrally concerned with the stewardship, preservation, and interpretation of Vermont's rich archaeological past. His own research explores issues surrounding Native American long-distance material exchange, ritual elaboration, and social crises, as these phenomena are evidence in the Northeastern archaeological record. He has authored or co-authored a number of journal articles, book chapters, conference papers, and technical reports about these and other topics. We are very pleased to bring you Jess Robinson. Hey folks, uh, thanks for letting me join you today. I love giving presentations at the Ethan Allen Homestead. Done it uh, a few times over recent years and I'm sorry that we can't be doing it in person. Uh, hopefully pretty soon, uh, if not I, then others will be able to, but I'm happy to have been asked and I'm happy to be presenting today on um, a topic that uh, I've been thinking about various parts of it for a while and uh, the synthesis today such as it is, um, is still an ongoing um, thought work uh, and um, I, it was spurned on partially by Fred Wiseman's work in, um, in Seeds of Renewal and in Early Agriculture, and I thought I'd present some new information about that to you. Um, and uh, also um, just bring up some new or relatively recent research on the woodland period in Vermont. So the woodland period in Vermont uh, is roughly defined between 3,000 years and right to the time of European contact or right around 400 years before present. Obviously, those are both moving targets on either end, but um, in as much as we try to have some typological boundaries on these things, which in, certainly in the real world part, probably you know, had very little meaning at all, um, it divides the past into, into chunks that we can take a closer look at. Again, uh, not only in Vermont, but in Northeastern archeology, span this is roughly 3000 years ago to the time of European contact. So the earliest part of this, the early woodland period uh, is quite interesting. Uh, and while some of these dates, as I just said, are arbitrary, some things were occurring right around 3,000 years ago, beginning around 3,000 years ago, that were really quite interesting. One was that uh, an interregional interaction sphere emerged, um, not in necessarily utilitarian materials, but in non-utilitarian materials, slate that was turned into pendants and um, different sorts of ornamental objects, copper that was turned into beads and other uh, ornamentation for the body um, or sometimes um, as sort of display objects. Galena or a lead ore that was primarily, we believe, used for uh, paint and pigment, perhaps on the body, perhaps for other things. Lithic materials, but that were often not utilized for your everyday spear point or arrow point, but rather were made into uh, elaborate, sometimes quite large, or what archaeologists call hypertrophic um, uh, spear points that were probably uh, ceremonial or um, 
sociologically important pipestone that was turned into smoking pipes, which obviously had a cosmological ritual um, and social significance as well. And I'm not going to dwell on this aspect. I've, I've actually talked about this a bit before, but it is notable that uh, Vermont and the Champlain Valley was really a kind of a nexus of where a lot of these far-flung trading routes were. Um, and that's uh, evidenced in some of the, the ceremonial and religious and cemetery sites we see in Vermont. And most of these material did end up um, in Native American cemeteries as, as far as we, we understand, but there are a few that were not that have been found in uh, non-cemetery contexts, including a copper ax um, found in uh, Lake Salem, um, likely from drift copper from Michigan, uh, and uh, a ceremonial blade of Rama Chert um, found along the Missisquoi uh, about 50 years ago um, in Berkshire. But the other interesting thing that happened around 3,000 years ago was the emergence of ceramic technology in the region, and not just in this region, but in the Great Lakes region, in the Appalachians, in the Ohio Valley. Um, everywhere, uh, pottery began to be produced around this time. And it was very distinctive pottery. Uh, one, it was had all the hallmarks of sort of early experimentation. Much of the pottery uh, that's from this time period is quite small, almost drinking cup sized vessels. Um, much of it was kind of poorly made as, it, as if they were starting to experiment with these new technologies. Um, and it has some characteristic attributes, uh, most notably fabric compressions on the interior of the vessel and the end, exterior of the vessel that might have served as some kind of decoration, but also helped smooth, get the air bubbles out of the pottery and was actually a technique that was practiced intermittently right up until European contact and beyond. Um, my colleague, Charlie Paik, when he, when he did a replicative study of um, a, Native American ceramic technology using really only the materials that they would have had to have been available to him, uh, to them, uh, noted when you were firing this pottery that there really was an interesting um, cosmological or ritual aspect to it if, if you were so inclined in that the pottery itself begins to glow, takes on a lot of attributes. And so while uh, pottery certainly uh, was and, and became uh, definitely a very utilitarian implement important for everyday life, a, a technological revolution in a lot of ways, uh, we also can't forget that it was probably, it, especially in these beginning times, are really probably um, socially and perhaps cosmologically a ritually loaded event when these uh, pots were constructed. But also, uh, as I said, this pottery was um, impressed, whoops, with uh, fabric, which then if you take clay and uh, you carefully apply it to a, a good fragment of the pottery that preserves that impression, you act, can actually reconstruct uh, through these negative impressions, what this ancient uh, fabric would have looked like. And you can reconstruct as my mentor, Jim Peterson did, uh, the, the weave and the weft, the kinds of fabric that were made, the different technologies that came into it. But one of the most fundamental attributes that is preserved in this is what is called cordage twist. And this is simply taking two plies of a fabric and you either twist it one way, which is often called S twist, or if you twist it the opposite way, counterclockwise, it's called a Z twist. It doesn't matter which direction you flip the cordage, it will always look this way. And this is a sort of um, uh, patterning that's really almost unconscious. Uh, ethnographic studies of, of, of different indigenous groups. Uh, normally fabric is created by women, although not exclusively. And what they documented was that um, uh, women teach their daughters to either roll the cordage up the thigh or roll the cordage down the thigh. There's not a lot of conscious thought that goes into this, but nevertheless, there is this difference taught through uh, learning networks through generations. And, my, again, my mentor and uh, 
um, uh, real uh, important person in Vermont and Northeastern archaeology, Jim Peterson, while he was in graduate school, published with his colleague Nate Hamilton a survey of these cordage twist directions uh, during this early woodland period. And if there was anything that you could get uh, in terms of potential ethnicity or social difference in the way that this cordage was made. And I readdressed this uh, a couple of years ago to see um, if those interpretations still held up uh, and also add to the existing corpus of documented cordage twist directions in the Northeast. And so we'll just go through a few here. Um, the Missisquoi Wildlife Refuge headquarters and porcupine sites, which we'll talk about again in a minute. Um, uh, had uh, some really remarkable um, vessel fragments of this Vinette One pottery. You can see here vessel 19, dated to roughly 2,350 years ago, um, had an S twist cordage throughout, uh, just some other early woodland deposits at the porcupine site at Route 78, um, Canaan Bridge site, which was excavated in the early 1990s. I'll just go through some slides here. A very uh, important early woodland site uh, and early middle woodland site. Um, lots of firecracked rock features, the remains of a lot of nuts, including butternut, uh, important fish remains, a really important site for this period, especially on the Upper Connecticut. Um, but it also contained uh, Vinette One pottery uh, dated to uh, uh, 2,550 years ago, oh, plus or minus with a distinct S-twist cordage. Another site in Newberry on the Connecticut, the Carson Farm site, um, again, dated to a very similar uh, timeline, uh, had S-twist cordage as well. And so those were just a few of the sites I added to this, this database that Jim Peterson and Nathan Hamilton had already compiled and looked across the, the Eastern Woodlands, but here is um, just the New England region. And I'll highlight in a minute um, this local region, but what you can see here is very much affirming what Jim Peterson and Nate Hamilton saw in the mid eighties, which is that the dark blue indicates mostly or fully S-twist cordage at sites, except with the notable um, exception of the Isle of Lamott Cemetery up in Isle of Lamott, you can see a very strong um, uh, predominance of S-twist cordage all in the interior, uh, certainly in Vermont and New Hampshire, uh, in Southern New England as well, but then in the Gulf of Maine, a very distinct cordage difference. And this affirms uh, what uh, um, Peterson and Hamilton were discussing, which that there does seem to be, at least by this one marker, a very interesting ethnic difference on the main coast that might have been a carryover all the way from the archaic period where the maritime archaic was located on this, that perhaps learning different uh, networks were different, perhaps um, uh, lineages. It's obviously difficult to say with this limited proxy, but there are others as well. Um, and so it's a very interesting case of using very, very small technological attributes uh, preserved in the archaeological record and making sort of synthetic and broad reaching um, inferences, not definitive in any case. Uh, this, is, this is not looking at biological realities or anything, but does uh, offer one line of evidence. And just, I love it as, a, as an interesting example of um, a very, very small attribute that can be elucidate broad patterns in prehistory or at least help to. So the rest of this presentation, I'm going to be moving on to uh, food and environment and some new interesting things that um, we are coming to light in the last few years and are, are still very much being thought about and ruminated. And also um, a little bit about lithic procurement patterns in the late woodland period too. So uh, while after the late Pleistocene, after about 10,000 years ago, there, um, the, the environment did uh, become steady, uh, much more regular than it had been during the long uh, up and down dynamic swings of the ice age. 
Nevertheless, uh, there were fluctuations in temperature. The previous slide you saw just see that. Not, not great fluctuations in temperature, but enough that as you can see here, forest compositions changed over time, temperatures shifted, different plant and, and uh, animal communities um, were on the ascendance or descendants. And that has important implications for how uh, uh, Native people, the Abnaki, uh, and their neighbors lived uh, in the past, how they could uh, make out on the landscape, favorable locations for settlement, and all of the things, these things that we can at least try to get at in the archaeological record. How uh, environmental scientists piece the, uh, the environment in the past together is largely through um, sediment cores and other proxies, but counting pollen percentages over time in lakes and ponds. And Vermont is pretty interesting, uh, like some other New England states, in that we have a very distinct altitudinal gradient as well, where below about 1,800 feet, uh, it's mixed woodland with a lot of deciduous forest trees among them. You can see the lower third of this photograph shows that pines and coniferous trees mixed in with a lot of deciduous trees, but above 1800 feet, you really get into uh, boreal forest conditions. And then at the very tops of the greens or whites, um, you, uh, you get uh, in a few places a remnant Arctic tundra left over from the Pleistocene. And so really as you're going uphill, in Vermont, if you're going on a hike from Camel's Hump or Mount Abe, for instance, you're almost going back in time through uh, forest conditions until if you get to the tops of the mountains, you're looking at sort of an analog of what the late Pleistocene 11, 12,000 years ago would have looked like. But additionally, um, forests have changed over the last few hundred years, largely due to, uh, to Euro-American uh, uh, impositions on the forest canopy, largely through cutting down. And uh, this is an interesting study that was done uh, by um, Thompson et al, uh, including uh, Charles Cogbell, that noted that the pre-colonial forest uh, was really beech heavy, and then a strong gradient of oak down in southern New England. This red sort of tint here you can see is the predominance of beech. And it, that was most of the forest cover in Vermont, as you all probably know, uh, was um, cut down for farming in the 19th century. And when it was regrown purposely, species were selected uh, for a number of attributes, but including um, their economic importance. And of course, maple was replanted. And you can see this bright red is the predominance of maple in New England. And we can actually see that when we look um, oh, here's just a, um, a, a slide, again, showing the percentages of, um, of trees at around the time of European contact, uh, as uh, documented through uh, Thompson et al. Cogbill. And um, you can see the predominance of beaches, maples are next, spruces, and then things like butternut are almost non-existent. They are there, but you really have to hunt them out. And that, that that informs what I'm about to say. Chestnut, very, very small. And of course, the archaeological record can help us inform um, uh, what native folks were eating in the past uh, when using for medicinal plants, uh, what wood they were burning, and by extension, get indirectly at, at the, the environments in the past. Um, and so this is a few years old now, and we're actually gonna update this and, and fill it out a little bit more with new analyses, but uh, we took 100, 136 features where paleobotanical analyses have been done and plotted them and then did some presence or absence. These aren't statistical averages, but are rather presence or absence, but are still quite interesting, just showing what uh, a typical uh, um, Native American feature would have looked like. And then here are tree species. And like Cogbill, you can see, again, these are incidences. These are not, um, you know, statistical uh, abundances. But um, 
beech, very prominent from 5,000 years on, is, is, is the most prominent taxon in terms of number of specimens identified. Um, certainly, uh, hop hornbeam is also important. Maple is, is important, but fluctuates through time uh, and different uh, species down the line. But important, uh, the forest character as revealed through the presence of wood charcoal uh, shows or uh, provides more evidence like codbill. Uh, different types of nut species in Vermont that could be utilized for food. And again, uh, we can see through time, again, these are incidences, uh, but butternut in every single period was the predominant uh, nut species being, um, being sought after, or at least as revealed in archeological sites. Now, there could be some preservation issues, butternut shells um, and nut meat might be more robust and, and so survive a little bit better. But nevertheless, uh, it's an overrepresentation given how in the previous couple slides, I told you how rare butternut trees were um, in general in Vermont, which means that butternuts were sought after nut and were probably, uh, not just haphazardly encountered, but people were going out on um, specific forays to gather these nuts and um, bring them back and processing them en masse. And so uh, they were, might have been favored because of the fats and oils that contained within them. Perhaps they just tasted better, uh, perhaps they preserved better, but they seem to have been overrepresented. And we'll get to some of that in a minute. And then cultigens. Um, yes, uh, all the evidence confirms that corn uh, or maize came in right around a thousand years ago, around a thousand AD. Uh, we haven't found any samples of actual maize that predate that. Uh, but interestingly, uh, Kenopodium or, um, or goosefoot seems to have been grown intermittently at least around 3,000 years ago. It's difficult to determine domesticated goosefoot from wild goosefoot, but it, it is represented in a lot of archaeological sites beginning around that time period and not before. So it makes sense that it was at least um, a, a low-level horticultural crop. Uh, we have one incidence of sunflower uh, between three and 2,000 years ago at the headquarters site in Route 78, which we're going to get to in a minute. Um, and then beans and squash as well. And then just uh, notably, I mentioned the Carson Farm site um, uh, before uh, with the Vinette One pottery from the early woodland period. A sample of that pottery was actually um, sampled by, oops, by my colleague, Karine Taché at Laval University. Uh, and was looking for the presence of lipids or fats preserved within the pottery matrix. And she identified uh, clear freshwater fish fats in those um, in, the, in that pottery shirt, uh, indicating uh, that there are new technologies that we can leverage on, um, on pottery and other uh, materials that can start to tell us uh, more about the life ways of, of uh, the proto abnaki and other Native American groups in the past. One other thing dating to that early time period I just want to mention is that uh, this is from the foot site in Cornwall, Vermont. You can see the, the feature I'm about to show you is, is this large area in, um, in yellow or yellow tan. This was excavated in the, in the late 2000s, 2009, I believe, or maybe even a little bit earlier. But notably, um, this enormous roasting pit, uh, which you can see sp spreads at least the, the amount that they uncovered, spread over uh, you know, 20 or 30 square meters, and there's more uh, in the intact ground. Um, uh, this is what it looked like in cross section, just an immense amount of fire cracked rock uh, and, and, and in fire reddened and blackened soil. A lot of material in that, including a lot of nuts. This uh, this feature dated to roughly 3,100 years ago, and um, the presence and the use of these large roasting pits is 
has been somewhat unclear, but recent research in the Pacific Northwest has indicated that these were actually tuber roasting pits. Um, and so while we don't have any evidence of uh, the remains of tubers, because they don't preserve that well, except for phytoliths and actually, uh, or starch grains, and we actually don't have anyone in this region that's looking for that material um, on a commercial basis that I can actually hire out to get those analyses done. It remains conjecture, but I believe that that is what these are. Uh, and so it's, again, um, if we can get some samples of that firecracked rock, which we have retained at the Vermont Archaeology Heritage Center and get them analyzed, uh, we might be able to tell a lot of different things about that. So I'm still looking. So for the final part of this talk, uh, I wanted to move to the late woodland period and just talk about a few things that um, we've seen for some recent reports uh, done in this case, largely by the Northeastern Archaeology Research Center and the UVM Consulting Archaeology Program. The late woodland period dates from around a thousand years ago to the time of European contact. And as I mentioned previously, it was really the time when corn, bean, and squash agriculture comes into play. And a question has always been, what, de what degree did life ways change with the introduction of agriculture? What did it do uh, did it shift native population settlement patterns? Did they become much more reliant on domesticated crops? And some recent sites um, are lending some insight into this that have been excavated uh, between in the last five to 10 years, but the reports have come in you know, over the last few years. And so some interesting new data here. Again, just a, a diagram of, of maize, typical early um, depictions of uh, native agriculture, in this case in your Iroquoian group. A couple of quotes that provide some potential insight into um, uh, the Abnaki and other groups in the Champlain Valley. Um, they don't spe specifically say which side, so it's difficult to know, uh, but this is Champlain saying, um, that he saw plains productive in grain such as I had eaten in this country together with many kinds of fruit without limit. Again, talking about uh, cleared agricultural foods, growing domesticated crops, and then kinds of fruit potentially referring to melons or, or uh, squash. This is uh, from Sanders, A History of the Indian Wars in 1828, notable because he was one of the first presidents of UVM. And so even though it was a, a nationwide early study, he spent a few chapters talking about uh, native groups in Vermont. Um, and uh, quoting here, Indian cornfields are plainly to be seen in various parts of Vermont. In the intervals of Burlington, 700 several hundred acres together were found by the American settlers, entirely cleared, not a tree upon them, the land's perfectly level, the soil made by vernal freshets, there can be no richer land. And then Pete Thomas, uh, as part of his dissertation on the Fort Hill uh, Sokoki uh, site in the, in the lower Vermont portion of the Connecticut, reconstructed a seasonal round based upon uh, historic and ethno-historic records of uh, the Abnaki at that time. And yes, uh, maize was important, uh, both the growing season and then for storage, as were beans and squash, but so were a variety of other uh, wild animals and plants. This is highlighting the animals here and notably include deer throughout most of the season, dropping off a little bit in the summer, uh, but moose, uh, shad, salmon, um, small mammals, wild plants, waterfowl, all of these non-anadromous fish or non-running fish, all of these were important in the seasonal round and indicating that unlike Iroquoian groups that really were transformed by agriculture, moved into uh, sedentary villages, became very reliant on domesticated uh, uh, agricultural crops, that yes, uh, maize, beans, squash were important, but still uh, hunting and gathering, foraging were important components of the overall diet and therefore probably had some um, 
some notable impact on settlements, life waves, as, as we might imagine. So what archeological evidence do we have for some of this? Well, uh, I, I've talked about this before, I believe at the Ethan Allen Homestead, but the Route 78 Improvement Project, the headquarters of porcupine sites in Swanton, Vermont, were really uh, incredibly important uh, for, and still are for understanding um, uh, pre-contact Abnaki lifeways in, in not only in the Swanton and Missisquoi region, but throughout all of Vermont, but certainly in the Champlain Valley. Um, this project was done in advance of a proposed road widening as it has yet to happen yet along Route 78. Uh, much of this was in the Missisquoi Wildlife Refuge, but not all of it. Radiocarbon dates spanning through the late archaic and into uh, all right up to the time of European contact. Uh, many dates, these are from the phase one and two, but there's actually many more now. We're, we're still awaiting the, the phase three or the final um, volumes to be produced because this was an enormous uh, undertaking. And this slide here uh, shows something that Ellie Cowie, uh, the director of, of the Northeast Archaeology Research Center at the time noted, which is that through time, you can see the earliest sites are the furthest upriver closest to the town of Swanton now um, and are very small. And not only do sites grow uh, through time in, in, in terms of uh, their size, by the blue is the middle woodland beginning around 2000 years ago, going out further out in the delta. But by the late woodland period, they're going much farther out in the delta, likely utilizing these uh, newly uh, emerged or, or stabilized and dry floodplain areas for uh, agriculture. The flood deposits preserve things uh, not only very well, but also as a layer cake. So you can go down through time and uh, see remarkably well-preserved things, um, cases that are not always true at archeological sites in Vermont. Among the most notable finds there was the first definitive longhouse uh, identified in Vermont, dating to around 1200 AD, so quite early. Um, here's just a little uh, video reconstruction, um, if I can get it going about what this might have looked like. This is not to scale. This is just a sort of impressionistic to imagine for those of you who can't see the patterns here at home, what it might have looked like. And associated with this longhouse was, uh, you can see these fine sediment layers are a midden or a sort of trash um, area along what was then probably the bank of the Missisquoi, preserving all sorts of um, food remains, waste um, materials as well, uh, in terms of uh, the remains of stone tool making, pottery fragments, all sorts of things that are preserved in this, in this midden sediment. Among those, of course, uh, was uh, maize kernels and other parts, but also abundant wild rice, butternut, acorn, shagbark hickory nut, kenopodium or goosefoot again, great blueberry, and a variety of other wild plant foods. Uh, animal remains included an abundance of deer, as is common throughout the entire archaeological record from the early archaic 10,000 years ago, right up to the time of European contact, but also beaver, Martin and a variety of fish here as well. Uh, notable, uh, amazing uh, collection of um, pottery throughout the early uh, to the late woodland period. And our, you know, Ellie uh, Cowie uh, from the Northeast Archaeology Research Center was just writing recently about some really interesting things that she's seeing in the pottery assemblage because it's really unparalleled in Vermont. Um, characteristic late woodland spear points or arrowheads probably by this time, um, called Lavana type, these triangular points. And you can see the predominance of this gray sparkly material called quartzite, but also here um, 
uh, a darker chert called Hathaway chert. And what's notable is this is the only site I'm going to be referring to in the next 15 minutes or so uh, where Hathaway chert is represented in any um, abundance in the late woodland assemblage. And that doesn't seem that surprising because the source of Hathaway chert is in the St. Albans area and on some of the islands in, in, in this uh, St. Albans Bay. So it's very close. Uh, but we're going to see an interesting pattern when we go to some other sites. And this is um, just a late woodland uh, pipe um, on the right fragment showing smoking pipes uh, were represented as well. Moving close to the Ethan Allen homestead, the Donahue or corn cob site uh, has a very similar pattern. And, and what I'm showing here in both the previous site and now is is those sites that are on the lowest reaches of the major rivers, uh, the big deltas, uh, the, the, the probably the most fertile areas um, where we would expect the largest late woodland uh, settlements to be because of the fertile floodplains, um, but also potentially some um, uh, dynamic areas. And I, I can show you this slide here where um, this is a, um, a schematic of the Winooski River um, and the dark area is 1802. It's, it's tracked through the, the intervale. 1830 is slightly lighter blue. 1869 is even lighter blue. And then the modern is the lightest blue. And you can see even through the intervale area how much uh, the, the uh, Winooski River has meandered. And when it meanders like that, uh, archaeological sites that were formerly on the, on the edges would be destroyed. Um, conversely, you can see the green and the red arrows indicate areas that red arrows indicate former channels, uh, that, that's LIDAR, um, that are hundreds of years old, and the green arrows indicate channels that are potentially thousands of years old. Um, and you can see that the native uh, at proto abnaki archaeological sites in the delta really correspond to these former and occasionally current channels. So um, proximity to these lower reaches was quite important. The Donahue site was radiocarbon dated to approximately 1415 AD. And again, th there was important maize here, and we'll get to that in the next slide, but there was also an abundance of butternuts, acorns, grape, deer and fish. Donahue site is currently the only site in Vermont where intact maize uh, cobs and partial cobs were recovered, um, meaning that they were almost certainly grown locally because from everything we understand, cobs uh, or uh, corn kernels were quickly processed into flour um, or other uh, food stuff. Um, and so what this indicates is that this corn was likely grown locally. Un unfortunately, um, when it was found in the, in the late 1970s, they covered all of the materials with, with glue, which makes radiocarbon dating or other analyses uh, pretty difficult or, or impossible. Um, also, uh, you can see a preserved in, in dirt matrix on the lower left, a, a, a deer mandible, again, indicating the importance of hunting. Um, and uh, these quartzite lavanas, one is a dark chert from the southern Lake Champlain area uh, and quartzite scraping tools, and then characteristic late woodland incised pottery. So those are the lower reaches. Then we move up into uh, the mid reaches above the falls, in this case, of uh, in, along the Winooski River. We get to South Burlington and a site uh, near the airport. Uh, excavated in advance of a, of a road uh, alignment change. Um, and this site was, was quite remarkable, not along the floodplain, but uh, on a much higher terrace right near uh, sort of the base of the airport, but a very, very large uh, late woodland Abnaki site. Um, you can see the profiles here. Uh, we don't have to get into that. But below the modern road fill immediately adjacent to the road, you can see the bottle sticking out there showing the modern fill in the, in the lower 
uh, right of the photo was this dense, what we call anthrosol or Native American living surface filled with artifacts. And underneath that were um, definitive um, features, storage pits, refuse pits, fire hearths. I don't have a picture of the actual Lavanas from this, but out of 113 recovered from this site, from the phase three excavations, all but three were made from quartzite. Notable again, we'll get to that in a minute. You can see the map in the, one of the main concentrations here of one of the blocks of the fire pits, the storage pits, the refuse pits. Uh, one of these pits was a very um, telltale bell-shaped storage jar, uh, storage pit, um, completely empty of food remains, but likely used for storing corn. Uh, and the heat map on the right uh, shows where all of the artifacts were found and the densest areas were in this, this um, uh, concentration of features. We didn't find any post molds or an alignment like they found on Route 78, but we do hypothesize that it was this uh, locus was probably a, a longhouse type structure, perhaps not as long or as, as large as that was found on, uh, on the Missiscoi. Um, another locus of the site, uh, which I'll show you the map in a minute, it was much less clear, no features were found, but a real abundance of flakes and lithic debitage. And then on the right, the, the uh, Lavana type arrowheads uh, found along there. And excavations were only conducted for the road alignment. And so you see where these two blocks were, where, where, the, um, where, the, where the road is going. Uh, with the white underlying it, the heat map underlying it, but all of those blue dots indicated uh, areas where artifacts were found. They're currently preserved in place, but you can see the probable size of this settlement, really huge. And those green squares that you see were radiocarbon dated materials, including maize all the way up in the current forest, butternut again represented, um, and all of them came out to 1315 AD. So what do we see here? Off the floodplain, probably a settlement that was very large, probably dated in the winter. Maize materials were represented, um, but uh, not in overabundance. And nuts were equally as common. We'll just go through these quickly again, even further up in Jonesville at the, at the confluence of the Huntington and, and the Winooski. Uh, this site radiocarbon dated to approximately 1500. No maize here at all, but a huge amount of butternuts. In fact, this perhaps was one of these collection and processing places, but also a great, great variety of not only really um, characteristic pottery, high predominance of quartzite, uh, bear remains. Um, you can just see a few excavation photos here. Again, these important floodplain settlements, uh, sediments preserving these uh, ancient settlements in pretty good context. Um, a couple excavation photos on the right, but then all of the food remains that they got are, are animal remains, bear, deer, beaver, porcupine, skunk, fisher, rabbit, muskrat, mink, squirrel, chipmunk. So still quite a sizable um, site. We can't really get at the numbers of residents at this site, but um, pretty sizable, characteristic of the late woodland period, but much more focused on hunting um, and uh, nut collection. Moving to the Otter Creek in the last five minutes or so, I'm gonna have to really hurry. Uh, this is a note from Peter Kalm, and, and when he went over, he was an early explorer, uh, went to Fort St. Frederick in the, in the 1730s, went over to what is now Port Henry and looked across the lake to along the Otter Creek and up towards the Green Mountains and saw fires burning. Um, and you can see this quote here, which he later attributed to Native Americans trying to drive game, but much more likely they were probably clearing areas for agriculture or a combination of both. And we've recently seen that, again, not at the mouths of the Otter Creek in this case, but mid reaches in Weybridge uh, at places like uh, the Wyman Island site, VT AD 44. Again, remarkably preserved floodplain sediments. Again, th these were done in advance of a dam relicensing. And so only areas that were subject to heavy erosion and really only along the eroded banks 
well, where the excavations conducted. So we don't have a full view of the fields. This is, this is impact specific. Uh, but even that um, remarkable evidence at a number of sites for um, maize, yes, but also kenopodium, elderberry, blueberry. You can see the, the remains here. Um, and an over uh, abundance of quartzite and the complete absence of Hathaway chert. Pottery from this site. One more, uh, the Wyman Island site uh, in Weybridge as well, again for dam relicensing. The features at this site were almost all late woodland in age. Many of them contain maize, but also a number of nut uh, and wild plant seeds, domesticated bean, sunflower, um, dated throughout uh, various portions of the late woodland period. And again, a very overabundance of quartzite. And because I'm running out of time, I'll just show one more, a couple more sites here. Um, moving to the Lamoille and Milton, right up uh, near the Peterson Dam. Um, no maize here, but a variety of uh, fish, deer, and beaver remains from a number of different uh, features or fire hearths and an overabundance of quartzite here as well. And finally, the last, uh, the, the last category of site were much more hunting related up off the floodplains into the high terraces in the woodlands. Um, very, very small sites, but one of the most notable at Camp Johnson um, was a very small site in terms of its aerial extent or geographic extent, very tight. But within this, um, roughly dated to around 1315 AD, a huge number, in this case, totally quartzite um, uh, uh, arrowheads um, and uh, a, a lot of deer, uh, marten and uh, bird remains showing that this was probably a hunting camp, probably one, two, three individuals for a few days. Uh, and I won't show the last site, but to sum up, uh, what we have discovered over the last few years, and it's the Royal Re, this is, we have to really, um, you know, give all due credit to uh, the uh, consultants, uh, NEARC and UVM CAP doing this work, is that uh, the lower floodplains, the lower delta reaches of the, of the rivers were certainly uh, intense focus areas, probably had the largest settlements, but there were settlements on the mid reaches of these rivers. They probably were growing maize at least intermittently as well, um, that it wasn't all focused on the lower reaches and that, that there's very intense but small in, in aerial extent uh, focused uh, hunting and extraction camps as well. And um, that the, 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 the entire landscape seems to have been well parsed out. And why I highlighted the, the quartzite is that relative to the previous middle woodland period, there is a distinct shift towards this material that outcrops in abundance, but not really uh, in the northern greens. It outcrops in the central and southern greens. And yet it is far, far overrepresented uh, at almost every large late woodland site we've seen, with the notable exception of the headquarters and porcupine sites, which are again along the Missisquoi, hinting at perhaps some sort of territoriality, um, some, some shift towards uh, those areas, um, begins really right around the start of the late woodland period. So we're not quite sure um, what to make of that yet, but it's, a, it's an interesting line of inquiry. And so with that, I think I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, hand it back to uh, Dan. Next month, we are really excited to bring you Shelby Ballack. Shelby is a history professor at Metropolitan State University in Denver, and she has agreed to present on women and religion on the Vermont frontier for this month. And as always, if you enjoyed this presentation and would like to support the Ethan Allen Homestead, please go to the donation link in the description box below or on our website, ethanallenhomestead.org. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next month.